Lockwood Meeks from Jamaica. I greet you with the joy and the confidence of knowing that we're only separated by waters, but we're not separated in spirit or hopes and aspirations. And so I want to offer my warmest congratulations to everybody who has made this festival possible. Everybody who has demonstrated our indomitable spirit that nothing will stop us from doing what it is we know that we have to do. I especially want to send some love to the light, Mama Trina, and to say a very happy birthday for your special storytelling day birthday. So I want to share a story with you about the rabbit and his song. Now in Jamaica, the rabbit is a very special symbol. As a matter of fact, we believe that if on the first day of the month you say, rabbit, 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 you're going to have joy and happiness for the rest of the month. Well, that must be why the rabbit, who was always a symbol of hope, wore this special smile upon his face. And that smile always disturbed King Lion. Why are kings always disturbed when the people are happy? But the people said, Rabbit carried a special song in his heart. And that upset King Lion even more. So he called an international convention of all the animals. And from Jamaica came the mountain goat and the crow and the mountain hog, oh yes. And from far away places came the elephant and the tiger. As a matter of fact, they said that all the animals from the air and sea and land arrived for this international animal convention to which the rabbit had not been invited. But Rabbit heard about it, and he decided to show up anyway. And he waited on the outside. And while he waited, all the animals came to the convention. They were dressed in their most beautiful furs, their finest feathers, and their beautiful skins. And there was Rabbit sitting on the outside, wearing nothing but his beautiful smile. They nodded hello to Rabbit and left him outside and they all went inside and waited for the king and pretty soon King Lion arrived with great pomp and ceremony bearing nothing but scorn for the rabbit whom he left outside and shut the door. All the animals stood to greet the king and waited for permission to sit which he gave with a special tap of his symbol of authority, the gavel. And when they were all seated, King Lion made another tap with this symbol of authority that he was ready to begin the meeting. But just when he opened his mouth, he heard a singing outside. Peace and love. Peace and love, peace and love, I leave with you. The king was in no mood for peace and love. He was just upset that somebody dared to be singing while he was about to start his meeting. And he called the elephant and he said, I want you to see who's outside disturbing my meeting. And the elephant ran outside and there he saw the rabbit. Oh, he was a shake in his head, and he was a stomp in his feet, and he was a clapping his hands, and he was having a great time wishing everyone peace and love. Oh, it's you, said the elephant, disturbing King Lion's meeting with this singing and this stomping and this clapping of hands. Well, I'll take one of your hands. 
and I'll give it back to you. Maybe when we're done. And he stuck it in his pocket and he went back inside and he announced triumphantly to King Lion that he'd taken care of the problem and now he could begin his meeting. But just when the king raised his cap, he heard the song again. Peace and love I leave with you. Peace and love. This time he sent the leopard. The leopard could not believe his eyes because he had been told all his life that one hand can't clap. But somehow the rabbit had made it possible to clap with one hand and to shake his head and to stomp his feet and to continue with his singing and the leopard took the next hand. You're disturbing the king, he said. And so I think I'll give this back to you. Maybe when we're done. And he went back inside, feeling rather victorious, and announced to the king the good news that he too had taken care of the problem. But just when the king was about to begin the meeting, you know what happened? He heard the singing again. Peace and love I leave with you. This time, it was the turn of that mountain goat. And that goat, he rushed outside and he saw the rabbit shaking his head and stomping his feet and singing. And he said, oh, it's you. You're still dancing. I think I'll take one of these legs and I'll give it back to you. Maybe when we're done, he announced the good news to the king who was just about to start the meeting when there was the sun again and out came Tiger. And Tiger saw the rabbit. Oh, he was hopping on one foot and he was shaking his beautiful head and he was singing that song Oh, then I think I'll take the other leg. And he announced triumphantly to the king that now you could continue your meeting because he has no hands to clap and no feet on which to stomp. But just when the king was about to begin the meeting, you know what happened. He heard the singing again. This time, it was the turn of that vicious dog and the dog ran outside and without so much as an excuse me please, he took off that head. And I'll give it back to you, he said. Maybe when we're done. The king was so sure that he could now conduct his meeting without any disturbance. He didn't even feel that he had to use his gavel to begin the meeting. But just when he was about to speak, oh yes, he heard the singing. And this time he decided that he would go and see for himself what was happening. And all the animals followed behind the king. And when the king went outside, he saw just the body of the rabbit without hands, without feet, without his head. And the unmistakable sound of that song of hope and joy. Peace and love I leave with you. And the king looked around to see where the sound was coming from. And in the chest of this body, where the heart should be, he saw this beating and he went closer and closer and closer and put his head to that chest and listened to that song. And then he turned around. He looked at all the animals. It was the most beautiful song he had ever heard. He called them all, he said. I'd like you to return the hands of the rabbit. I'd like you to return the feet of the rabbit. I'd like you to return the head of the rabbit because there is nothing as beautiful 
as a song you carry in your heart. You should all be like the rabbit, declared the king. Keep your song deep in your heart. Your song is your good luck charm. It is your dream song, your dream of hope. Keep it in your heart where no one can reach it. And dance, dance, dance. And all the animals danced to the song of the rabbit. And maybe one day they too will find their own song. Hi, it is my pleasure to tell you a story that comes from our history for this evening. I want to tell you the story of the first African American to graduate from Providence High. And this story goes like this. Maricha Raymond Lyons was born in 1848 in New York City. She was the third of five children born to her parents, Albro Sr. and Mary. Now they were free and they were business, business owners and prominent members of the community. They had a boarding house, so often the rooms were full and the table was filled with people at the end of the day talking. The house was also a station on the Underground Railroad. So Maricha heard many stories of people who had risked their lives running from captivity onto freedom. And she knew her parents were risking their lives as well to provide this shelter. When she was young, Maricha was too sickly to go to school as her brothers and sisters did, but she did have a tutor come and teach her. And very early on, she developed a love of learning. In fact, she loved to study for study's sake. She was often found buried with her nose in a book. In 1863, in July, the summer in New York was hot. And I'm not talking just about the temperature. I am talking about the political climate. Because you see, in January of that year, the Emancipation Proclamation had been issued and the Civil War was heating up. There was need for soldiers. And so the draft notices had gone out and in New York, there were riots. You see, the white men who couldn't come up with the $300 to avoid the draft had taken to the streets. They were furious. They had also been told that if the North won the war, when the freed people came from the South, they would flood into places like New York City and they would take over their jobs. There was fear, there was fury, and the riots were ridiculous. The men were going through the streets and they were pulling up the railroad tracks and knocking over the telegraph poles. They were destroying black businesses. They even burned down a black orphanage. Albro was able to get his family out of the heat over to Williamsburg, but it wasn't far enough. So the Lyons family got on board a train and they rode from New York first to Massachusetts. And then after a little while, they went back to New York, but it still wasn't safe. So Albro got his family on the train and they settled in Providence, Rhode Island in 18. 1865. They were living at 16 B Street and they quickly set up business. Albro opened up an ice cream parlor and his wife Mary started a hairdressing salon. And when the summer was over, oh, Maricha couldn't wait to go to school. She was 16 years old and she was ready to go to high school. Her older siblings had finished their schooling and her youngers would be going to the grammar school, but she would be going to high school. She and her mother went to Providence Girls High so that she could register. And as soon as she was arrived, she was informed that the high schools were not open to colored children and they were dismissed. Maricha and her mother returned home. But I already told you this was a family that knew all about fighting for justice and freedom and equality. 
So the family got connected with a movement that had been happening in the black community, spearheaded by a man by the name of George Downing, who had also come from New York. He had landed himself in Newport, where he was a caterer, and for years he had been petitioning the Rhode Island State Legislature to desegregate the schools. Well, Maricha was involved in the planning this time, and she had an important job to do. When she was 16 years old, she had a letter in her hand and she climbed up those state house steps and went and stood before those men who were members of the legislature. She delivered her message to the assembly saying that she encouraged them to support the desegregation of schools, arguing that education was a doorway that opened all opportunities. Well, she must have done a good job, as did the others who were involved in this long fight. And when the legislature voted, they finally decided to desegregate the schools. And that cleared the way for Maricha to go to Providence High. I wish I could tell you that once she got to school, everything was fine, but you can imagine that wasn't the case. In fact, she walked into the school and the white girls who were there would rather sit themselves in the windowsill or crowd in their own desks rather than share space with her. But that didn't matter to Maricha because she was there for the love of learning. <laughs> she was there because this was her doorway to her opportunity. She studied hard, and it wasn't long before the school teacher, Sarah Doyle, recognized what a good student she was. And four years later, in 1869, Maricha Raymond Lyons was chosen as one of the four speakers at Providence Girls High graduation. And on that day, she was the first African American to graduate from a Providence high school. She spent the rest of her life in education and activism, as she had seen her parents do, as she had done herself as a young woman. She did until the day she died. And that's the true story of Maricha Raymond Lyons for you. I want to begin by honoring those that came before us, those that walked this earth, gained knowledge and passed it down to us. Our roots are strong because of them, so we owe it to them to tell their story. Those unsung heroes who brought care and compassion to the carnage of war. Those unsung heroes who brought salvation when lives were threatened by war. Those unsung heroes who brought hope when the world was ravaged by diseases and pandemics. I salute them all. And I am going to reach out to them using my mbira, a gateway, a bridge to our ancestors. Ha ho ha ho ha ho ha ho 
Thank you. Enjoy the festival. Light and love to you all. God bless. Para saber y contar historias no han de faltar y aquí comienza este cuento como me lo contaron se los cuento long time ago in a small town in the south of chile there was a shoemaker he was a very poor shoemaker he was that poor 
that sometimes he had not enough money to feed his children and wife. But he was always working and working hard, repairing shoes, making boots, repairing sandals. One night he was tired, maybe he was distracted. He was making a beautiful pair of red boots. And when he was putting the sole and heel together, accidentally he hit a finger. Oh, diablo, diablo, diablo! Diablo in Spanish is the name of the devil. He had not finished to say the last word when right there in front of him, the evil one was there. The devil himself. The shoemaker was very surprised, but the devil greeted him very politely. Hmm. Good evening. Did you call me? What? No, of course no, I didn't call you. Why are you here? Screamed the shoemaker. Oh yes, you did, said the devil. Everybody knows that if you say my name three times, you're calling me. So here I am. Tell me, what do you want? The shoemaker didn't know how to apologize, what to do. And the devil, the devil was not patient at all, and he was beginning to get annoyed. Okay, 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 I'm already here. And as far as I can see, you are in a total misery. I think I can offer you a... What? interrupted the shoemaker. A deal! I will not make a deal with you! The devil then looked with a very offended expression on the face. Oh, a deal! A deal! That is a very unfair accusation. Who is talking about deal? I wanted to offer you a business proposal. Sure, said the shoemaker, who didn't trust the devil. You will buy my boots. The devil <laughs> smiled and get closer and closer and said, Look, I'm not interested in shoes or boots. I am interested in souls. The shoemaker felt as shears uh, as is a piece of ice running down the spine and said, I cannot do that. Oh, yes, said the devil. Of course you can. Just think about it. Think about your misery. Think about your life. Think about your wife and children. They wouldn't suffer anymore. I can give you all that you want and even more. Money, fame, long life to enjoy with your family. Just think about it. The shoemaker thought about it. He looked around the walls, the floor. Oh. And then he had a good idea to fool the devil and said, Okay, okay, Mr. Devil, I think I can think about it. I will accept with one condition. If you put money on these boots before the rooster crows, I'll give you my soul. The devil laughed. <laughs> That's simple. I give you that. And when you die, I come to get your soul. Yes. Oh, yes, said the shoemaker. Okay, my home delivery staff will visit you soon. And the devil disappeared in a cloud smelling sulfur. Quickly, the shoemaker looked at the 
hole in the floor. Took the red boot, removed the sole, and put it in the hole. Just then, two little devils came to his door with bags of golden coins. They came and put the coins in the boot, and the boot didn't fill up. Then the two devils went back to get more, but the boot didn't fill up. And again, and again, and again, the two devils went to get more and more money, more and more, trying to fill the boot. And the bills didn't fill up. And then, right then, the roster crowd. And the two little devils, woof, disappear. The story doesn't tell what happened with the devil. But our shoemaker had a very good decision. He decided to build a two-story house. In the first floor, he installed a large shoe store. And in the second floor, he could live comfortably with his family. But as a precaution, he may put silver crosses in all the windows and doors just in case the devil came to climb the soul. The builder who came from the capital also brought a beautiful lead up neon sign that says Zapateria, which in Spanish means shoe stores, with the name of the shoemaker. The shoemaker looked and thought that maybe many people in the village didn't know how to read. So he had an idea. Yes, the origin of the fortune he made with wood, a big red boot to hang it next to the sign. So everybody looked and said, oh, the red boot shoe stores, Zapateria, La Bota Roja. And if you don't believe me, if you are someday come to Chile, you can go to the south to my town called Mulchen. And there are the trees in the main street. Still there, polished by wind and rain, the red wood hanging next to the sign. The red wood shoe stores. Now you all know where the name come from. Cosi Cosi, ya fella. And as we say in Chile, colorín colorado, este cuento se ha acabado, colorín colorado, este cuento ha terminado. Thank you very much indeed. How the rabbit lost his tail. Long, long ago, when stones were soft and animals weren't quite ready yet, the rabbit and the dog were best of friends. They were always together. They were best of friends. They would have breakfast together, lunch together, supper together, best of friends. One morning they were having breakfast together when Anansi came by. Now, Anansi was rather jealous of the friendship between the dog and the rabbit. Nobody here is jealous, right? Way to be, way to be. Anansi was jealous. He wanted to start some trouble between these two friends. The dog saw Anansi first. The dog said, Anansi, what are you doing up so early? You never get up before 12 o'clock. <laughs> Anansi said, I wanted to get up early this morning, you see. For there's a boat leaving, and the boat is going to the magical island. <gasps> the magical island? I've always wanted to go to the magical island where you can't go. Why not? You don't have any horns. The only animals allowed on the boat are animals with horns that can't go. But I want to go on the boat. I want to go on the boat. I want to go on the boat, said the dog. You can't go. You don't have any horns. The dog looked at the rabbit and said, Rabbit, rabbit, I want to go on the boat, I want to go on the boat, I want to go on the boat. 
The rabbit said, you heard what Anansi said. We don't have any horns. We can't get on that boat. Anansi knew he had planted the seeds of trouble. So Anansi went back into the woods to his home. The dog said, but I want to go on a boat. The rabbit said, let me think, let me think. Ooh, 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 I have an idea. Let's go in the woods. We'll each get two long sticks and a couple of leaves. We'll poke the sticks up through the holes in the leaves. We'll get some vines and we'll tie the sticks off. We'll make headpieces like bonnets. And once we place them on our heads, those sticks, they'll be poking up in the air like that. It'll make us look just as if we have horns. And that's just what they did. They both went into the wood, each found two long sticks. They got a couple of leaves. They poked the sticks up through the holes in the leaves. They got some vines and they tied the sticks off. They made headpieces like bonnets. But you see, the headpieces they made were rather heavy. And they had to help one another place them on each other's heads. So the dog said, rabbit, you help me put mine on and I'll help you. And the rabbit agreed. He picked up the dog's headpiece and he placed it on the dog's head. The dog took those vines, he tied a nice knot under his chin. Then the dog walked over to the water to look at his reflection, and with those sticks poking up in the air like that, it made him look just as if he had horns. He looked at his reflection in the water, the dog said, I look nice, I look nice, I look nice. The rabbit said, yeah, you look nice. Now help me put mine on. Wait a minute, I'm looking at myself. <laughs> I look nice, I look nice, I look nice. Will you help me? Well, just then. <laughs> the boat started to leave. Dog said, whoop, I gotta go. Goodbye. <laughs> Shoo! And off he went. The rabbit said, but wait, but wait, but wait for me. And the dog ran, and he got right in line with all those animals with horns, and he got right on that boat. Who can tell me some names of animals with horns? A wildebeest, yeah, yeah, a yak, an ox, a goat, a unicorn, a gazelle, an antelope, a buffalo. All those animals with horns are getting right on that boat, and that dog with his phony horns, he got on that boat too. The rabbit looked, the rabbit was angry, and the boat started to sail away. Well, the rabbit noticed a little hill next to the water. He quickly ran over to that hill, and as that boat was sailing by, rabbit called out, he said, Captain, oh Captain, one of your passengers has no horns. The dog quickly went over to the captain and said, Captain, did you hear what he said? He said, turn the boat to the left, to the left. And the captain, he turned the boat to the left, to the left. The rabbit, he ran over to the next hill and he called out. He said, Captain, oh Captain, one of your passengers has no horns. And once again, the dog went over to the captain and said, Captain, you hear what he said? He said, turn the boat to the right, to the right. And the captain, he turned that boat to the right, to the right. Rabbit looked, there's only one hill left. He ran to the top of that hill and he called out in a mighty voice, and I need your help. Captain, oh captain, one of your passengers has no horns. And the wind took those words across the water over the stern of that boat, right to the captain's ears. And the captain said, one of my passengers has no horns. Trim the sail, drop the anchor, stop the boat, and line up. And all those animals lined up. And that captain, he walked over to the cow, and the buffalo, and the bull, and the yak, and the unicorn, and the gazelle, and the antelope. And he was getting closer and closer to the dog. The dog knew he was going to get caught. The dog quickly jumped over the side of that boat and started doing the doggy paddle. The rabbit looked, he saw the redness in the dog's eyes. That rabbit, he lit on out. Shoom! And as he ran, 
His long tail flopped and he ran and his long tail flopped. The dog was doing the doggy paddle. Until he got to the sandy beach where he shook himself dry and lit out after that rabbit. Now the rabbit ran and his long tail flopped and the dog was gaining. And the rabbit ran and his long tail flopped, the dog was gaining. The rabbit ran and his long tail flopped, the dog was gaining and gaining. Finally, the rabbit reached the safety of his home and he jumped down that rabbit hole. But he didn't have enough time to pull down that long, beautiful, fluffy tail. And the dog came right up behind him and went, Arrgh! and bit the rabbit's tail right off. And ever since that day, rabbits have short little tails and dogs are always chasing them. Yes, they do. Let's go and fetch firewood. Oh, it was a great idea. And she followed them. Far and far and far away from the village, the girls went. Far and far away until they reached a certain thick forest. They entered and immediately she started to collect firewood. While the girls went and collected wild berries to eat. She was collecting firewood. Oh, this firewood is so good. It's so dry. And she collected heaps and heaps. But little did she know that the girls had run from her back to the village. And there she was left stranded in the forest, looking around for help, looking at her heap of firewood and wondering what she would do. And time was going. And she noticed it was going to rain heavily. With tears in her eyes, she was so scared. And at a distance, 
she could see a little hut. Oh, she collected her firewood, put on her head, and rushed to that hut. Oh, she thought to herself, now, now, Miran, I will keep myself warm here until tomorrow. But little did she know the hut belonged to a monster. He came back staggering with game in his hand. He looked and he noticed the door to his heart was open. And he was pleased for this woo, fresh meat that had brought herself into his heart. And he said, probably I'll eat her today or tomorrow. And she cried, please do not eat me. I, I, I'm a good cook. I know how to take care of the home. I'll take care of your, your, your home. I'll cook for you. And he said, OK. So the following day, he went off to hunt. And Mudondo made her way to escape back to the village. But as she tried to leave, she had a sound. It was a song, and when she looked back, there was a hen on the roof that was crying out. The monster came staggering. Uh, 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 where are you? Where are you? And she ran back to the hut. And every day she tried to escape. It was the same story. That furiously suspicious looking hen would climb on top of the hut and sing out for the monster to come. But this day, she had a plan. She got the seeds that lay in the corner of the hut, stuffed them down the throat of the hen, put the hen on her head, and put the firewood on top of the hen. And she started to run out of the monster's home. By the time the cock cleared the throat of the seeds, she was way far gone. She met a group of fishermen, and she requested that they put her on her boat and let her cross to the other side. She would give them the hen, the fishermen allowed. And she found her way back to the village. And oh, it was a celebration. The people were so happy. It was a feast. The children danced, the women danced, that everybody was excited to see Dondo back home. And I left them celebrating. I came to tell you the story. There's so many things to learn from that story. But you can go along with this song from Uganda. Thank you very much. Once upon a time, 101 years ago, when we did not know freedom like today, we know, and when my country was under the rule of British, one day he, Uddham Singh, stood looking around him, seeing people, 
wounded, dying, dead. Blood everywhere. He heard shrieks and cries and wails. Wails of men and women and children, injured and dying. Was it a dream or was it real? And who was he? What had happened there? Well, he was Uddham Singh, a 19-year-old young boy. A boy who was an orphan. He had come there to serve water to the people who had gathered there. To serve water to the thirsty. People who had gathered at Chalyawala Park. A ground. Gathered on the holy occasion of the Harvest Festival, their main festival. People had come all the way from villages near and far. And then there were people from the city itself who had gone to visit the holiest shrine they had and taken a dip at the holy waters and then gathered at that ground. That ground had only one narrow entrance and it was surrounded by high walls on all sides. There were boys who had gathered to play there like they did every day. And then there were some people who had gathered to protest, protest peacefully against the arrest of two leaders of the city. And he, Uddham Singh, was serving water to all. When suddenly in marched 50 soldiers led by a British general, they took positions. The gathering realized what had happened and hush, a silence fell. They waited for next instructions. None came. The only orders were to the soldiers. Fire! Next 10 minutes. 1,650 rounds of bullets were fired at innocent, unsuspecting, unarmed children, men and women, young and old. Some died immediately and then there was mayhem. They ran helter and skelter, wanting to escape, but where could they escape? The only entrance was blocked by the British. So some tried to climb the walls which were there. The guns shot at them and they felt it. There are bullet marks in those walls even today. Some spotted a well and they wanted to hide inside so they jumped inside and more followed and more and more and all of them suffocated inside the well. Some fell during that stampede with people running helter-skelter and got trampled upon. Ten minutes. Hundreds dead. Thousands injured. The firing stopped. The soldiers were led out by the British general. Curfew was imposed on the city. And no help came to the injured, dying, or dead. And he, Uddham Singh, who had gone to serve water there, he looked around in horror, in disbelief, shock, angry, sad, all at the same time. He tried to help as many, but there was not much he could do. And then he took some blood-soaked soil in his hand, held it in his fist, looked up at the sky and around and took a vow. A vow to avenge the death of his countrymen. The sky, the ground and the wind stood witness. 
in that ground had walked a 19 year old young boy eager to serve water and out walked a 19 year old man with fire of revenge and anger and hatred burning inside his heart and a desire to to free his country of Britishers. And he became a freedom fighter. But could he take revenge on those who caused this? Well, years passed, 21. And that day did come. He learned that there was going to be a gathering or rather a meeting of many prominent people in London. He too was there and he made his plan. He carried a thick book, which was actually a revolver case, which he had himself made. He wore a long overcoat and went to that meeting, sat through it and as it was going to get over, he got up and strode towards the stage took out that revolver from that thick book and shot at Sir Michael Tyre, the person who had signed the orders to kill innocent people on that fateful day. Sir Michael Tyre died on the spot. People there, white people, ran helter and skelter trying to save their lives, but he did not shoot the innocent. He just stood there. He did not run away. He just stood there waiting to be arrested. And arrested, he was taken to the prison. A case was opened against him. British Empire, British land, British court, and the person who had died was also a Britisher, accused an Indian. Verdict, Udham Singh was to be hung till death. He smiled and accepted the verdict. He was doing this for his people, his country. And finally, that day came. He marched, brave, proud, head held high to the gallows. He kissed the noose and then it was put around his neck. They hung him, killed him but he did not die. He became a martyr. Martyr Uddam Singh, a son of my land, India. Once upon a time, long, long ago, when we did not know freedom, like today we know, many innocents were killed British wanted it so, but many young people rose to make the Britishers go, go, go. Thank you. Hello there, everyone. Greetings. My name is Eugene Skeeth, and I greet you in the name of love and compassion and peace and harmony. This is my story for you. The legend of Noloazi Maazi. Once upon a time, there was a very wise young girl called Noloazi Manzi. Her first name meant daughter of knowledge or she who knows and her surname Manzi meant water. Her family's clan praises celebrated their special gifts of understanding the deep secrets of water and its natural powers of healing. She was given this name in a dream when she was born 
because the midwives could see from her widely open eyes and mesmerizing voice when she announced her arrival that she carried the seed of wisdom deep inside her soul. The elder women of the village already knew about Noloazi's special gifts because they heard her singing a chant when she was still in her mummy's tummy, when it was at its roundest. The chant said, Ses figi, ses figi, ses figi, ses figi, meaning we have arrived. But when the mother heard the sweet voice inside her, she replied, Asgarafi, Asgarafi, which meant we have not yet arrived, meaning that her day for entering the world had not yet come. It made sense then when the midwives looked into the baby's eyes and listened to her voice that she knew things without knowing them. She didn't have to live through experiences to know them. This gift proved to be a blessing when one day as a young girl, Noloazi received an instinctive insight that something terrible was going to befall not only her village, but the entire world. She knew before the event that something disastrous would happen to all of humanity. That the world would change in such a way that all memory of beautiful things and experiences would need to be cherished and held in our hearts and shared lovingly. Noloazi knew that this was the only way that the whole world could survive the catastrophe of the new disease that was spreading like an unattended forest fire. This new disease was called loneliness. Something had to be done. Even though the situation was desperate, Noloazi knew that this had to be done calmly. The flame of love and peace and compassion and empathy for all life had to be rekindled. These qualities that are the seed of joy, family, friendship and fulfillment had to be regenerated. Noloazi knew that getting the balance of life's beauty back was very much like watering a fragile plant whose flowers were wilting from thirst and lack of sunshine. As a daughter of the clan of the water spirits, she knew that she needed to send her message across the waters that linked all the continents on earth. She knew that she had to spread her message of hope to every single soul on the planet. The best way to achieve this was to inspire the people across the world to believe in their innate ability to change the world from a place of distress to one of hope. Noloazi knew that she needed to make people have a strong sense of faith in themselves, to teach them to know themselves more deeply, to know that they don't need to go anywhere else to find the answers to their distressing situation because they are already where they need to be, that they have arrived. So she sent her chant across the currents of every ocean, every river, every lake. Ses figi, ses figi, ses figi, ses figi. Impilwe, we have arrived. We have arrived at the place of well-being. Sesfigile, sesfigile ebushen. We have arrived. We have arrived at the place of beauty. And everyone, everywhere, did not respond with Asgarafi, Asgarafi. 
but like a world choir conducted by the almighty ancestral spirit. They chanted loudly back to Loloazi and in every other direction, Ses figi! Ses figi! And then suddenly, the heavens burst open with the loudest thunderstorm that the people had ever heard. And the African swallows became a cloud in the sky over the ocean as they danced their return home from their migration to the northern countries of the planet. And they revealed the light of their joy as they broke into song and rain poured down from the skies and fell on the people's faces as it cleansed them of all the pain and misery of the disappearing disease of loneliness. Tos tos ya pele, ses figi. Thank you.